Good morning, everyone. My name is Javier Ocampo, uh, Chief Residence for Internal Medicine. Today is my distinct pleasure to introduce Dr. Jorge Ruiz, who will be talking to us about frailty in hospitalized older adults. Dr. Ruiz completed his medical training in Universidad Peruana Cayetana Heredia in Peru. He attended internal medicine residency at St. Agnes Hospital in Baltimore and did his geriatrics fellowship at the University of Florida in Gainesville. He currently is an associate professor of medicine and the director of the geriatrics fellowship at the University of Miami. He also is the associate director for clinical affairs at the Geriatric Research Education and Clinical Center, or GREC, in the Miami VA. Dr. Ruiz's extensive scholarly work is focused in frailty, medical informatics, e-learning, pharmacology in the geriatric, geriatric population, dementia delirium, and medical education in geriatrics. Please give a warm welcome to Dr. Ruiz. Uh, thank you for the introduction. Uh, I will be sharing my screen. Okay, thank you. Uh, so this is the title of my presentation. So I will be covering the following topics during this presentation. I will review the aging syndrome of frailty. <laughs> and talk about the older adult with frailty. Uh, we'll discuss the effects of frailty on hospitalization and how to identify hospitalized older adults at risk, including those most recently admitted with COVID-19 infection. And we'll present some data uh, uh, of studies in the VA. I'll go over evidence-based intervention targeting older adults with frailty, and I will conclude my presentation formulating a research agenda. So, frailty is a nature-related stage of vulnerability to stressors characterized by reduced functional reserve. And I highlighted in there the two keywords, vulnerability and functional reserve. There are two types of frailty. Uh, one that we call primary, a manifestation of a, an accelerating aging process. And secondary, the one resulted from the effects of chronic medical and mental multimorbidity. Most researchers uh, in medicine have started acknowledging the limitations of chronological age as a predictor of clinical outcomes. And I'm not just talking about geriatricians, but many other uh, specialists. Frailty, on the other hand, seems to represent a better marker of biological age. The etiology of frailty is caused by multisystemic dysfunction, including amongst the most well-known uh, mechanisms that may be relevant to my talk. Inflammaging or an age-related state of chronic low-grade inflammation. Immunosenescence that is characterized by a reduced ability of the older person to mount an adequate immune response to infections. And also uh, uh, related to inflammaging as a predisposition to a pro-inflammatory state. There is also evidence of mitochondrial dysfunction characterized by reduced bioenergetic responses and impaired oxidative capacity. So resulting in a reduced production of energy in older adults. And there are many other mechanisms, but another one that is important, I think, for uh, purposes of this discussion are stem cell exhaustion with decreased re regenerative processes that lead to an impaired recovery and resilience in older adults, especially those that are hospitalized. Why is this important? Because frailty is very common in older adults, defined as those over 65 years of age. Depending on the studies you look at, about 10 to 20% of all older adults in the community have frailty. However, among hospitalized older adults, data from meta-analysis shows a median prevalence of 49% uh, with a range of between 34 and 69%. So it's a very common problem in older adults that are in the hospital. Groups of older adults at higher risk for frailty include women, the poor, and educated, minority, sedentary, and those suffering from chronic multimorbidity. Frailty is associated with poor clinical outcomes, including further morbidity, functional decline, higher healthcare utilization that includes hospitalization and mortality. The prevention and treatment of health include generic measures, the most important probably exercise, but also in combination with diet that may be high protein or Mediterranean diet, and the specific treatments that de will depend a lot on the 
underlying medical condition that precipitates frailty, like I mentioned in the type of frailty called secondary frailty, or sometimes vitamin D for those patients that are deficient. So for a clinician, how is that we are able to recognize frailty? There are two major conceptualizations of frailty. The most commonly used in research is the frailty phenotype that is based on the longitudinal cardiovascular health study. The frailty phenotype is based on a predefined set of five criteria, exploring the presence or absence of signs or symptoms. And you can see them in the slide, five of them involuntary weight loss, weakness operationalized as a poor hand grip strength, poor endurance or exhaustion, low activity, and a slow gait speed. The number of criteria is categorized into a three-level variable uh, depicting robustness or fitness when none of the criteria are present, pre-frailty when one or two criteria are present, and frailty when three or more criteria are present in the older person. The second conceptual framework for frailty is the deficit accumulation model, which quantifies frailty by using a frailty index. The frailty index allows a measure of frailty that has very strong biological um, underpinnings with animal studies and basic science uh, supporting its use. As seen in the figure, frailty index variables may include comorbidities, functional parameters, cognitive status, measures of mood, as well as sensory deficits. By considering these deficits across our, this range of domains, frailty indices may offer a summary indicator of health at various stages of life. People with higher levels of frailty are at higher risk of adverse healthcare outcomes when you define frailty according to this frailty index. And as you can see in the table, the exact items that make up the frailty index appear to be less important than measuring at least 30 deficits. Uh, so it could be more 40 or 50, but the minimum, uh, I guess, in the validated study, 30 deficits. As we will see, some of the instruments that we'll be discussing that are using hospitalized older adults are based on this model. And, and that's why it's important to keep it in mind. So why is it frailty important for clinicians that take care of older adults that are hospitalized? As I mentioned before, older adults with frailty are vulnerable and are vulnerable to stresses. And certainly hospitalization represents a major source of stress for patients with an already reduced functional reserve. Uh, when comparing hospitalized frail versus non-frail individuals in cohort studies, the findings are consistent. Baseline frailty is associated with a higher risk for hospitalization. But once these older adults with frailty are hospitalized, frailty is independently associated with a higher risk for ICU admission, prolonged length of stay, more functional decline at discharge, higher rates of 30 days readmissions, higher rates of nursing home placement, higher in hospital mortality, higher overall mortality up to two to three times than non-frail older adults. Growing research that is coming out uh, as part of the COVID-19 pandemic shows similar data in those older adults that contracted COVID-19 infection and are frail. This data suggests that identification of frailty in hospitalized older adults is a key step in the management of these patients. But it would be ideal that just by looking at a hospitalized or older adult, we could recognize frailty. However, this identification is by no means straightforward. We must depend on validated measures and instruments to make such determinations. Many clinicians, again, face caring for older patients face this a big problem. And like many other chronic medical conditions, Frailty is often under-recognized by patients and providers, and when recognized, rarely documented. That is, baseline frailty status will be mostly unknown to hospital-based clinicians, physicians. Investigators have come up with many different measures that may identify frailty in hospitalized older adults. We have already discussed the frailty phenotype and related physical assessments that are part of it, 
that we've seen in practical and will display floor effects in hospitalized patients. Results with frailty indexes as originally designed are mixed and indexes are rarely available anyway. Hospital-based clinicians need measures that provide more accurate and practical determinations of frailty in hospitalized older adults. In the following slides, I will review some of the most commonly used, the hospital frailty risk score and the FI lab. The hospital frailty risk score is a geriatric risk stratification model that is derived from routinely collected administrative data or claims data that is, ICD codes available for electronic health records, as seen in the table. This is from the original paper. It is based, again, on the deficit accumulation model that I described earlier. Most of the studies were done in Europe, and actually this instrument was originally developed and validated in the UK. Its advantages are its low cost, and it can be automated, providing rapid information about frailty to hospital-based physicians. Conceivably, in any setting like in hospitals in the United States that have electronic health records, you could probably automate this tool for use uh, at the bedside. The hospital frailty risk score is predictive of adverse events, including in hospital mortality, length of stay, readmissions, inpatient costs, and nursing home placement. However, the hospital frailty risk score is of limited value in ICU settings and can only be generated after an initial admission. That means the patient had to, be, had to have had a previous admission, so risk stratification information will not be possible at, for patients that have been admitted for the first time. It may be useful in this case for very high risk holder patients as, such as those are high utilizers or the so-called high need, high risk group. The FI lab is a frailty index uh, based on laboratory values and vital signs. The FI lab has shown good diagnostic accuracy and prediction of multiple clinical outcomes, including hospital mortality. It is also based on the deficit accumulation model that we reviewed earlier as an accepted framework for frailty. The FI lab may capture some of the etiological age-related changes of frailty that predispose older adults to the effects of stresses such as hospitalization and that I described earlier. In the table, you can see an FI lab based upon admission labs and vital signs that we created in the VA and used for a few studies with hospitalized older veterans. The FI lab represents a practical approach as it can be easily automated again out of electronic health record data such as that in Epic or Cerner, but conceivably even in low-income countries may be easier to implement. We obtained the FI lab in, uh, on 1,381 consecutive hospital admissions to the Miami VA between 2015 and 2018. This is data that has been submitted for publication. Patients were admitted from the emergency department with diverse acute medical problems. As you can see in the graphic, over a median follow-up of two days, a multivariate survival analysis adjusted for multiple sociodemographic and other covariates showed that the highest FI lab score was independently associated with higher in hospital mortality. But not only that, in our study, the high, highest FI lab score was also associated with longer length of stay, 30-day readmissions, nursing home placement, and six and 12-month mortality. The area under the, curve, under the ROC curve showed a good predictive accuracy of the FI lab for in hospital mortality. We compared it in this study to a, a validated measure of frailty, also from electronic health record data, that is the VA frailty index. The COVID-19 pandemic has resulted in a multitude of complications, including higher rates of hospitalization and mortality. Older adults, are far more vulnerable to adverse healthcare outcomes and mortality after contracted COVID-19. And these effects are probably better, best seen in the hospitals. However, the risk does not appear to affect all older adults equally. Older adults with frailty are at a much higher risk for cl poor clinical outcomes than non-frail. Nursing home patients exemplify that. They are mostly flair, frail and having fat suffered the highest rates of in-hospital mortality. 
I have already reviewed some of the multiple biological changes with frailty that contribute to the increased risk, including H-associated changes to the immune system, such as inflammation and immunosenescence. We cannot ignore certainly other clinical factors such as the increased prevalence of chronic multimorbidity that can contribute to secondary frailty. And certainly environmental reasons such as congregate living arrangements in long-term care facilities around the world. But it's important that to recognize that in older adults with frailty, the innate, innate immune system of activity that I described earlier and that translates into the cytokine storm appears to be a criti critical in the development of the worst consequences of COVID-19 infection in older adults with frailty. Identification of older hospitalized with frailty becomes a key step in the management of these patients that are admitted with COVID-19 infections and related complications. Most studies included in a recent meta-analysis investigating the association of frailty with mortality in older adults with COVID-19 infection have used the clinical frailty scale. The clinical frailty scale is uh, easy to implement judgment-based frailty tool. You can see it there in the picture that evaluates a specific domains, including multimorbidity, function, and cognition to generate a frailty score ranging from one or very fit to nine or terminally ill. A key issue that may limit the uh, practicality or the feasibility of this tool is that when you complete the clinical frailty scale, a comprehensive geriatric assessment is required, which may be impractical in most hospital settings. A higher score in the clinical frailty scale was associated with higher in hospital mortality, 30 and 60 day mortality. In another meta-analysis, the ratios between the clinical frailty scale and mortality were linear. However, there are other concerns besides the ones I already mentioned about this instrument because of its subjectivity, uh, issues with inter reliability, and the fact that they may not actually accurately represent baseline levels of frailty. Once again, we use the FI lab upon admission in the study of veterans hospitalized with COVID-19 infection. This time, we look at data from seven VA hospitals across Florida and Puerto Rico. 546 veterans were hospitalized with COVID-19 infection confirmed by PCR between March and August of 2020. And you can see clearly the FI lab performed well as a predictor of in-hospital mortality. The moderate and higher FI lab predicted higher in-hospital mortality. Another value that you are probably well aware of is uh, uh, the neutrophil lymphocyte ratio that has been studied mostly in cardiology and oncology as an indicator of overall acute inflammation and a predictor of poor clinical outcomes, especially in response to treatments that are given for patients with these conditions. This is a very thing COVID-19 correlates with neutrophil to lymphocyte ratio as a surrogate marker of systemic inflammation. The NLR ratio positively correlates with advancing age and frailty. Again, the NLR ratio is indicative of low-grade inflammation or inflammation, and is a poor prognostic, poor prognostic factor in COVID-19. The NLR, by measuring the depletion of lymphocytes coupled with neutrophil elevation or the innate response, may be an early indicator of an impending pro-inflammatory cytokine storm. We recently uh, completed a retrospective cohort study of 593 older veterans, some of the same ones I described earlier with COVID-19 infection, of whom over 60% were frail, measured with the VA frailty index across Florida and Puerto Rico. The highest NLR tertile was an independent predictor of in-hospital mortality as compared with the lowest tertile after adjustment for covariates, including age, gender, BMI, race and ethnicity. What about the interventions to address the problems of hospitalizations in older adults with frailty? Unfortunately, there is a dearth of studies specifically looking at hospital-based interventions targeting older adults with baseline frailty. However, we can extrapolate evidence from studies investigating the efficacy of care transitions interventions that are widely used now by hospital medicine teams which often included uh, older adults with frailty as defined with various criteria. 
Certainly, in addition to the treatment of the underlying condition precipitating the hospitalization, other general measures may help improve outcomes for older adults with frailty. The care transition intervention is an evidence-based intervention consisted of emphasis in medication self-management, patient-centered records, adequate follow-up with uh, uh, aiming for a smooth transitions between the hospital and community, and educating patients, caregivers, and providers in the community about the patient's illness. In clinical trials, inter this intervention has resulted in lower rehospitalization rates at 30 and 90 days, also lower rehospitalization rates for the same condition precipitating the in this hospitalization at 90 and 180 days. So what is the role of geriatric medicine in the care of hospitalized older adults with frailty? Once again, the evidence is scanned, but the frailty criteria not consistently defined. Meta-analytic evidence from 29 trials, including over 13,000 patients in, most, in nine mostly high-income countries show that comprehensive geriatric assessment, or CGA, aiming at assessing clinical, cognitive, functional, nutrition, and social parameters, results in most patients being discharged home, have better quality of life, are less likely to be placed in a nursing home, and despite the higher cost of including a geriatric team, was cost-effective. There was no evidence of reduced mortality or rates of functional dependence upon discharge. The evidence is still uncertain regarding the length of stay, effects on length of stay, and whether comprehensive geriatric assessment delivered in an acute geriatric unit or as part of a geriatric consultation team is better, or any other effect of intervention or cognitive function or readmissions as seen in the table. We have very little data currently about geriatric interventions in patients admitted with COVID-19. In terms of post-discharge interventions, the evidence is also scanned. Home care seems to work for disease-based conditions, such as congestive heart failure, coronary disease, and COPD that are certainly more common in older adults with frailty. In terms of geriatric medicine, some observational evidence suggests that Comprehensive geriatric assessment by geriatric nurse practitioners identify more problems, potentially amenable for treatment. A randomized control trial of comprehensive geriatric assessment combined with a home intervention team resulted in reduced length of stay, improved function, and delayed nursing home placement. A case control study of comprehensive geriatric assessment and home-based rehabilitation reduced disability in frail with repeated hospitalizations. A small, but some evidence of benefits for all the adults in frailty upon discharge. So what are the suggested next steps for research? We presented data from retrospective cohort studies and actually the literature is now full on data, uh, retrospective cohort data, especially for those patients with COVID-19 infection and frailty that have been hospitalized. A prospect prospective cohort study will serve to confirm these findings given the limitations of retrospective cohort data. Future studies can look at whether the described instruments identify patients with frailty most likely to be responsive to clinical interventions. Particularly important is to identify those patients less likely to improve and maybe more likely to benefit from goals of care discussions, hospice, or palliative care. We need randomized control trials that clearly outline frailty criteria and implement inpatient interventions targeting these patients. A priority group, maybe those older adults with frailty who have already become higher utilizers or the so-called high need, high risk group that I mentioned earlier. So in conclusion, frailty is common in hospitalized older adults. Frailty is associated with worse clinical outcomes. The risk, the risk seems to be even higher in those hospitalized with COVID-19. Frailty identification and admission to the hospital is feasible with valid instruments, including the uh, hospital frailty risk score, FI lab, the neutrophil, neutrophil lymphocyte ratio, and the clinical frailty scale. We talk about evidence-based interventions, including hospital-based and geriatric consultation interventions in hospital care transitions, and again, the role of comprehensive genetic assessment. I'd like to acknowledge the contributions of the members of our frailty research group at the Miami VA. Greg, including geriatric attendings, advanced geriatric fellow, geriatric medicine fellows, and Greek research scholars. 
thank you and I will welcome any questions. Thank you, Dr. Ruiz, for a very important topic and very well reviewed. Clearly this in the, today's day and age about uh, hospitalizations and length of stay, uh, appreciating the role that frailty plays will allow us to make interventions to shorten those lengths of stays. I was wondering in your, uh, you, you, your practice is primarily at the VA, right? I, I would imagine, is there any, have, have you uh, um, integrated frailty indices in your electronic medical record and, and, and the outcomes that you've seen, has that improved length of stay? We, uh, that's a good question. We have not yet implemented that. This study is relatively recent, uh, but we are certainly working with our hospital medicine team to do so next uh, and, and thinking about implementing also interventions that may include uh, now criteria for when to call geriatrics, for example, when some of the patients are identified as frail upon admission, but not yet. Thank you so much, Dr. Ruiz. Anybody have any questions, I'm sure he'd be more than happy to answer them uh, in the chat or uh, email them directly. Let's move on to our next speaker, Dr. Kipu. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Um, it's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Sirota. Uh, he is an assistant professor in the Division of Infectious Disease. His clinical care and research focuses on treating patients with infectious complications of drug use, including HIV, hepatitis C, and severe bacterial infections like endocarditis. He is a volunteer physician at the DOCS IDA clinic and helps to run a buprenorphine program at our needle exchange funded by the State Opioid Response Grant. In August 2020, he started at Jackson Memorial Hospital's Integrated Infectious Disease and Addiction Team, which he will be presenting on today. Additionally, he is a longitudinal clinical educator in our next-gen MD curriculum at the Miller School of Medicine, and he himself is a proud Miller School alum, class of 2013. Dr. Sarada. All right, thank you for that introduction and thanks to uh, Dr. Weiss for inviting me here today. Let me just get my slides pulled up. All right, so I'm gonna talk to you about my uh, program that we started last year, looking at integrated infectious disease and addiction care at Jackson Memorial Hospital. So uh, it's no surprise to anyone who's practiced in a hospital over the last couple of years that there's been major increases in the number of patients with what we term severe injection-related infections. So these are things ranging from soft tissue infections to more severe things like endocarditis or osteomyelitis. And there's been ample research over the last decade really showing increases in every type of infection in every part of the country and actually in some international areas as well. And so Jackson, um, you know, again, not surprisingly, has not been spared from this. So using administrative data, looking at diagnostic codes, we were able to pull some numbers for the number of injection-related infection hospitalizations. And so over this one-year period, we identified 413 hospitalizations for these infections at Jackson. And what you'll see is the hospital outcomes are um, quite poor compared to a lot of our other conditions. So between one in five to one in four leave the hospital against medical advice before finishing treatment. Again, most of these are for life-threatening infections. And more than half typically are readmitted within 90 days. There's also a long length of stay. And this is all on top of the emotional and sort of trauma toll that these hospitalizations take on patients. And so I think, uh, you know, a lot of us in this academic center have sort of, you know, one and two week stints on clinical service. And we see a lot of these patients as a small snapshot and don't really get the big picture view. So if we look at the long-term outcomes of patients with injection drug associated infections, in this case, the yellow line represents endocarditis, you can see that within five years of a diagnosis, 42% of people have passed away, mostly related to their infection or drug overdose. And so um, it's also important to note that the median age in this cohort was 36 years old. So I kind of like to think about it as if there was some newly identified malignancy that was affecting 30 year olds and had a 42% five year mortality rate you know, we would have a public health crisis on our hands and a cancer moonshot and everyone sort of 
working together to try to solve this problem. And in fact, if you sort of um, model out these numbers, some folks have identified that nearly a quarter million people will die from injection drug-related endocarditis alone over the last 10 years. And this is all in addition to the 90,000 drug overdose deaths in the US annually. So our treatment currently is rather inadequate, I would say, and I think these are some of the reasons. So typically these patients are um, sometimes held in the hospital under the Marchman Act, which is sort of a legal way to keep someone there when they want to leave. Um, while they're being held in the hospital, they often have untreated withdrawal and their pain is not well treated. Patients really universally um, report stigmatization by healthcare providers, the system in general, and specialists are often involved. Surgeons see these patients. They usually try to avoid doing surgery whenever possible. Um, infectious disease physicians, I think, are not without any blame. I think, you know, we often come onto the case. We say this person has MRSA endocarditis and needs six weeks of IV vancomycin and then sort of disappear from the case and leave it to somebody else to carry out that plan. And it's really clear from the health system that these people, patients have addiction, but I argue that's sort of seen more as a nuisance rather than a medical problem in need of treatment. So one really kind of, I think, typical case, this is a woman I saw in my first couple months on faculty here in 2019. And I saw her in September of 2019 when she was here for her third episode of endocarditis. Uh, she ultimately uh, ended up dying of her infection. And looking back over the last couple of years, you can see she was in the hospital at Jackson for 148 days over two and a half years. And with all of that medical care, likely millions and millions of dollars, um, all unfunded, uninsured, we still did not save her life. And looking back over those two and a half years, she never really received the standard of care evidence-based treatment for her opioid use disorder at any time during those hospital stays. So while I think we don't have a clear answer to what is the best overall way to treat patients with severe injection-related infections, I'll sort of highlight some of the best practices and I think the things that we do know with pretty good certainty. So we know that medications for opioid use disorder are highly effective and have a proven mortality benefit. And so this mortality benefit has been shown in a variety of different uh, circumstances. So in primary care and post-incarceration, as well as specifically in people with injection drug related infections. And so one thing we really, really need to focus on is scale up and implementation of this effective medication, typically buprenorphine and methadone in these cases. We also know that uh, you know, a lot of these patients really can't carry out the care plan as we would typically recommend. So staying in the hospital to get six weeks of IV antibiotics is really not feasible for most patients in this situation. And it's also not really therapeutic for their recovery. And so we need to be a little bit more adaptable and think outside the box in the way that we treat these patients. We also know that post-hospitalization is an incredibly vulnerable time, especially for patients to overdose, as well as for leaving the hospital against medical advice and not receiving antibiotics for these severe infections. So we really need to focus on providing a very clear connection between the inpatient and outpatient setting. And then finally, not all patients want to or are able to achieve abstinence from drug use. But all the data we have to date, especially in the HIV literature, shows that um, infections can still be well treated and health improved, even if someone continues to use drugs. So this is an area that I've been uh, researching for a number of years, and I've done some work documenting the deficits in addiction treatment for these patients. And I've also sort of advocated for a new specialty of infectious disease physicians who treat addiction. So the idea being that if we can integrate treatment of these two conditions, we may have better outcomes. And so that's the theory behind the Jackson Siri team, which is a program that I helped start. And we started seeing our first patients in August of 2020. And so the team has these sort of five components. So I'd say one of our uh, highest priorities is implementing these 
highly effective medications for opioid use disorder, uh, getting people on them in the inpatient setting, and then making sure that they continue to take them after leaving the hospital. We provide integrated care, longitudinal care with the same providers. So unlike most other parts of the healthcare system, patients see the same people in the hospital as they do out of the hospital. We have a lot of different options for antibiotics and addiction treatment. And then we do really um, hands-on care coordination for patients, both in the hospital and after discharge. So looking at things sort of um, across the health system landscape, Inside of Jackson, we serve as a consult team. We do follow-ups. Um, I kind of consider us to be like a consult plus team in that you know we'll talk to case managers, we'll help arrange follow-up, help get people into residential addiction treatment and homeless shelters as needed. Once someone leaves the hospital, we continue to follow them on a really close basis, often one to two times per week contacting the patient, either seeing them in person or talking to them by phone. And then the goal is to follow them for about 90 days, get their infection cured, and then help them uh, get linked to sort of long-term treatment for their opioid use disorder or other substance use disorder. And I won't go through this in detail, but you know, I really almost present this literally to patients as far as the different options that we have in treating them. So we have a lot of different antibiotic approaches. We have a bunch of different medications that are shown to be effective for substance use disorders. And then we have um, a small but you know, present uh, variety of places that we can send people or give them places to go after they leave the hospital, um, as well as different ways of providing care to them. So, so far we've seen 21 patients and you can see some of the demographics here. Uh, I highlighted the rate of homelessness, bonelessness, and lack of insurance as I think pretty typical of a lot of the people we see at Jackson. And similarly in the substance use area, you can see that really this is a good representation of the modern opioid epidemic, which is now really more of a dual opioid and stimulant use epidemic. And so together, 95% of our patients use stimulants and all of them use opioids. This is just a little bit about the distribution of infections that we've seen so far. Uh, it's not all inclusive, but you know, about a third of people had sort of the lower acuity infections and more of them had the higher acuity, higher intensity treatment infections. And so our top line kind of preliminary results so far, uh, interestingly, there was not really much of a difference in the AMA or against medical advice discharge rate, but you can see that we cut the 90 day readmission rate by about two thirds. On the right, you can see this is our business card that we give to each patient the first time we see them. It's a box of Narcan with a little sticker with our contact number, cell phone number, and really a sort of 24 hour way to get in touch with our team. As far as patient outcomes, so some of the important metrics are finishing your antibiotic course. So all of our patients have finished their antibiotic course as prescribed by the infectious disease doctor compared to a, um, a sort of historical cohort in the literature that's usually about 40% of people with a Siri complete their antibiotics. 100% of our patients have left the hospital on a medication for their opioid use disorder. Um, this 6% figure comes from a study of injection drug-related endocarditis. So again, the most life-threatening infection. And on a, uh, this is a national cohort, only 6% of people received buprenorphine or methadone. At 90 days after completing, uh, after discharge from the hospital, 83% of our patients have been in recovery from substance use disorder. This 9% at 30 days is from the usual care arm of a study of inpatients with opioid use disorder. And then finally, you know, you can see that once someone is sort of stable from a medical standpoint, their addiction is under control, we're able to make some pretty good impact on their housing and other aspects of social function. So 81% homeless initially, now down to 30%. So that's kind of what we have right now. The next steps for the Siri team are to expand our volume and expand our team. 
So at the moment, it's just myself and a nurse practitioner. And we're looking to get a social worker and peer navigator to be a more constant presence. I have a CIFAR pilot study that's ongoing that's looking at um, some quantitative, a little bit more robust quantitative analysis of our outcomes so far compared to a historical control. And then we also have a application into the NIDA clinical trials network to do a multi-center randomized trial looking at the impl in, uh, implementation of this model of integrated ID and addiction care for patients with Siri. And so if that gets funded, it would be at five hospitals across the Southern United States. So my last point, I'll just say, I want to raise awareness. We're trying to sort of come out of our beta phase, beta testing phase of our um, uh, program here. So um, I'm just raising awareness. So please give me a call at any time if you're seeing a patient hospitalized at Jackson that you think might be a candidate for our program. I left our number there, 854545 is uh, forwarded to either myself or the nurse practitioner at all times. And then I have a list of people who have been really instrumental in helping this program get off the ground. And so I thank you all and thanks for the time, Dr. Weiss. Dr. Sirota, thank you very much, giving us new meaning, somber and important to Siri and uh, not all, nothing that I had associated with Siri in the past. This is really good. Um, and congratulations for your success. I have a quick question. Um, given that we know that there are significant social determinants of health that affect medicine and affect one's uh, clinical outcome, I, it, it, I wonder whether or not there's any biologic connection that we can find between addiction and infection. We know the source of the infection clearly is from the needles. And we'll hear, I guess, maybe something about needle exchange from the, the master in, in just a minute. But if you could, has anyone ever made any biolog biological process connection between uh, Siri and, uh, and, and, and addiction? Yeah, I mean, I think definitely there's a lot of data on the immunosuppressive properties of chronic opioid use. And this has been shown in patients who are on opioids for chronic pain and susceptibility to infection. There's a study, I think, in JAMA Internal Medicine looking at community-acquired pneumonia rates. Um, but I do really think that in this case, the patients we're seeing, it is primarily behavioral. And so, you know, people have addiction for a whole number of causes, sort of the biopsychosocial model of addiction. Um, and one consequence of that is these infectious complications, which Dr. Tooks will probably talk about as well right now. Okay. Again, uh, please address any questions you have for Dr. Sirota in the chat or uh, email him or call his number, 8545545. Okay. See, I remembered it already. Dr. Tooks, or I'm sorry, our chief resident to present Dr. Tooks. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Jelani Grant. I'm one of the new internal medicine chief residents. It's my absolute pleasure to introduce Dr. Hansel Tux III. I had the honor of training under him as a resident and look forward to his presentation. Dr. Tux joined the faculty at UM uh, in the Division of Infectious Disease after completing his residency in internal medicine at Jackson. He lobbied for the Florida legislature for five years, advocating for the creation of the needle exchange program as an evidence-based method to help decrease Miami-Dade soaring HIV infection rate. In 2016, Dr. Tooks was finally successful and the Miami-Dade Infectious Disease Elimination Act has now been signed into law. Today, he's a medical director of the IDEA Exchange Clinic, which helps hundreds each year. Join me in welcoming Dr. Tooks to present teleharm reduction for the initiation of antiretrovirals. Thank you, Jelani. It was a pleasure to have you on Team One. Come back again. Uh, so I'm going to talk to you about teleharm reduction. This is uh, an Avenir uh, award that was just uh, awarded recently. I'm very, very excited to get started on this. So uh, please, uh, you know, my enthusiasm is going to jump through the computer. So just to start, uh, we'll talk about HIV incidence. We all know that the South is disproportionately impacted by HIV. Um, Miami-Dade County ranks number one in new HIV infections. And nationwide, people who inject drugs 
account for 10% of the 40,000 new HIV infections. This really highlights the importance of prevention and treatment in this vulnerable community. HIV outbreaks continue in people who inject drugs unmitigated in our country, including in Miami. Our go-to evidence-based preventative health intervention for HIV, hep C, and injection-related injuries among pe amongst people who inject drugs are syringe services programs. So SSPs are community-based programs that are grounded in harm reduction. We're meeting people who inject drugs where they are and respect for their autonomy. At their foundation, they provide access to sterile injection equipment and disposal of used syringes. But in the US overdose crisis, SSPs have expanded to naloxone distribution, HIV and hepatitis C testing, vaccination and wound care. They are expressly identified in aging, ending the HIV epidemic of Plan for America as a cornerstone of the prevent pillar, but we can show how they can be leveraged for the other pillars of diagnose, treat and respond. Decades of research have highlighted the effectiveness of these programs for primary HIV prevention, and they've truly become, become a home base for people who inject drugs. However, like Jelani mentioned, prior to 2016, they were expressly prohibited by law in Florida. So here's a recent paper that I co-authored with the Dean uh, in Academic Medicine. It highlights the last decade of my life. So uh, those of you who know me know that I spearheaded a 10-year journey to bring syringe exchange programs to Florida. And this is no simple task because the political climate is, uh, let's say, complex. So there were two key translational studies that showed significant need for these programs. The first was a study on syringe disposal, uh, where we showed that Miami had eight times the number of improperly discarded syringes on our streets compared to San Francisco, where there are lots of needle exchange programs handing out millions of syringes. Uh, the, so then, <laughs> so we published that first study and then we went to Tallahassee and talked about saving lives and we, we promptly realized that they did not care, but they cared about the money. So we came back to Jackson, we looked at the cost of the infections that Dr. Sirota just talked about over a one year period uh, in, uh, at Jackson and it was $11.4 million. So the legislature uh, authorized a five year pilot project, but it was imperative for us to do rapid evidence-based implementation and scientific research at our program, including statewide analyses so that we could successfully advocate for the expansion. You can see here, this is the rate of overdose in Miami-Dade County. The reduction in the number of opioid overdoses uh, was our earliest success and the outbreak investigation and response was our second. So if you look here, uh, this is responding to the Miami outbreak. So we identified seven acute HIV seroconversions shortly after implementing our testing infrastructure. So we test people every three months for HIV and hep C. You can see here, each of these is a patient testing HIV negative. Here in red is where they tested HIV positive. And auspiciously here in blue is where they were virally suppressed. And the average time to viral suppression from the positive test, that idea was 70 days. But we had to create a pathway to care for, to HIV care for people who are experiencing homelessness and injecting both fentanyl and stimulants. We forged a very strong partnership with the Department of Health. And this was a seismic shift because they had opposed our legislation in the Capitol. But through our partnership, everybody was suppressed. Uh, importantly, we asked the people who inject drugs how we could best help. Uh, and one suggestion was medication storage on site, as well as deliveries. We really had a community-based participatory research approach to the development of this teleharm reduction intervention, and we placed people who inject drugs at the center. Uh, in the larger investigation, unfortunately, only 53% of those who were involved who were previously diagnosed with HIV, um, only 53% were virally suppressed at the end of the study period. And that is because the traditional healthcare system has completely failed people who inject drugs. Uh, we are far from the 2020 target of 80% viral suppression in this high priority community. And the reason is, if we look at Merrill Singer's uh, syndemic theory, you can see all of the structural barriers that are faced by people who inject drugs that have been exacerbated by COVID-19. So we have mental health, substance use, uh, pandemic related stress, racism, loneliness, poverty lack of social support. The one bright spot in all of this was the shift to telehealth delivery of services. But even though COVID accelerated the use of telehealth, we had been planning on implementing telehealth for HIV care uh, because prior to test and treat under Dr. Alan Rodriguez, uh, it took 
two months to get into HIV care uh, in Miami. So we won an ending the HIV epidemic planning grant, grant in 2019. We conducted stakeholder focus groups uh, with decision makers so that we could forge a same day pathway to HIV care for people who inject drugs. In our qualitative interviews, we ascertained the acceptability and feasibility uh, and then we implemented our telehealth protocols and we chose telehealth because it's supported by the Infectious Disease Society of America and it's grounded in evidence. This is an innovative approach that's rooted in harm reduction, but we really need to take healthcare out of the traditional healthcare system and to the people, but we must overcome the digital divide so we much, must innovate. So what is teleharm reduction? So that's the intervention in our randomized controlled trial, and it's bringing care to people who inject drugs through technology. So it's telehealth enhanced, they're on-demand services, very much like concierge medicine. There's low barrier access to antiretrovirals, medications for opioid use disorder, uh, hepatitis C cure. We have capabilities for mobile phlebotomy. We have harm reduction counseling coming from peers, as well as medication management. There's access to a clinical psychologist, uh, and treatment for substance use disorder. And this is all delivered via our syringe services program integrated with the provision of evidence-based naloxone and injection equipment. So we have, evidence, we have elements of a pragmatic clinical trial, uh, but the, fundamentally we need to meet people who inject drugs where they're at on their terms and respecting their autonomy. And there are decades of evidence of this approach in primary HIV prevention. So just to hit it home, the patient is at the center the peer harm reduction counselor brings the iPad to the patient uh, and connects the patient with the physician or psychologist. The physician prescribes medications, which could be antiretrovirals or buprenorphine, which are delivered to the patient with the provision of core harm reduction supplies, syringes and naloxone. And through this cycle, there's ongoing motivational interviewing. And we've seen early success from piloting this infrastructure at our program. So you can see our pilot data from 2020, we enrolled 43 participants in the safety net system for paying for antiretrovirals, which is Ryan White. Uh, we conducted 43 visits with physicians, either uh, myself or Dr. Sirota to initiate care. Um, all 43 initiated antiretrovirals and the last, uh, at last labs, 33 or 80% were undetectable. So this happened through 146 HIV care visits, 80 visits for, uh, for buprenorphine, but our goal is to integrate these specialty pathways of HIV care, medications for opioid use disorder, and hepatitis C treatment through harm reduction. So what are we gonna do? We will have uh, a two-site, actually we're going to actually now do a three-site clinical trial. It will be IDEA Miami, IDEA Tampa, and Flash Exchange in West Palm Beach. Uh, there will be 120 per site. We'll have two arms, teleharm reduction uh, or patient navigation, which is currently the standard of care where our linkage team brings people to uh, Jackson for enrollment in Ryan White case management, as well as HIV care. Uh, and the primary hypothesis is that this comprehensive approach, teleharm reduction will be superior to patient navigation in viral suppression across the time points. The secondary hypotheses are that it will be superior for uh, medication for opioid use disorder, initiation and retention, as well as hep C cure. And to determine sustainability, we'll do a cost effectiveness analysis. So you can see here, so inclusion and criteria are age 18, speaking English or Spanish, a detectable viral load and ability to provide informed consent. We will collect the biologic outcomes over 12 months uh, we will do behavioral assessments to evaluate the moderating effects of the intervention on all of those syndemic factors I showed you in the uh, figure from Merrill Singer. Uh, the primary outcome will be the time averaged viral suppression over the time points. We'll use urine drug screens for buprenorphine initiation and retention, uh, hep C RNA for hepatitis C cure. And that's the trial, which really captures my personal evolution from research to, to advocacy, to rapid implementation, evaluation and innovation, ultimately leading to statewide expansion of syringe services programs in Florida 10 years later. It's a fundamental shift from my recent body of work. We have published 13 studies since 2019 looking at harm reduction in Florida. We looked at uh, the one-for-one -one, uh, syringe distribution policy at our program, showing that 90% of our clients did not obtain sufficient coverage. So we need a needs-based distribution model. 
we conducted a statewide analysis of all hospitals to estimate the economic burden of the injection-related injuries Dr. Sirota talked about. And it showed $380 million prior to statewide implementation of SSPs. Using the same cohort, we looked at hospital outcomes such as patient-directed discharge or mortality and showed that co-occurring stimulant use with opioid use significantly increased negative health outcomes among pe amongst people who inject drugs. And we looked at how to best implement HIV and hep C testing, finding that opt-out testing significantly increased testing uh, uptake at our program from 40 to 90%. And this is extremely important because that's how we uncovered, investigated, and responded, responded to the HIV cluster amongst our participants. So all of this work led me to where I am today, uh, poised to lead this clinical trial. So we've established the infrastructure and we're ready to exit the ivory tower or green, gla green glass tower uh, that I'm sitting in right now and go to the community. And this will change the way we deliver HIV care to people who inject drugs uh, across the country. We're going to transform the way we practice medicine and teleharm reduction is the next logical step. We're gonna lay the foundation for an enhanced model of care for people who inject drugs to become virally suppressed. We're gonna transform the way they access healthcare, forge a pathway towards ending the HIV epidemic in this high priority community and overcome marginalization and stigma by meeting people who inject drugs where they're at. It's imperative to provide an integrated evidence-based HIV linkage to care and retention intervention amongst people who inject drugs, because currently there are no effective interventions in this community. So this is truly the right study at the right time because of the rapid expansion of syringe services programs across the country, not just in Florida. So it's truly a high risk, high reward study. And I hope that this efficacy trial will set the groundwork for future studies to examine the implementation of this integrated telehealth delivery system or teleharm reduction for people who inject drugs. So I'm supported by this amazing study team in pursuit of team science, I will be mentored by uh, Dr. Metch, uh, Dean at uh, Columbia, and Dr. Feaster, our very own sat, uh, sat, Biostats Pro. And they have decades of experience in uh, clinical trials on the NIDA Florida Clinical Trial Node. I have Dr. McAllister helping with the economic evaluation. Dr. Sirota and Ochsner are our, tele, our, our harm reduction physicians. Uh, Dr. Forrest is our idea program director and uh, a medical anthropologist and Dr. Suarez is a clinical psychologist. The Florida Department of Health is a true partner to us. Uh, and with them, we are leading the statewide expansion of syringe services programs. Currently 10 programs are cooking, three are open. So with that, I would be happy to take your questions. Dr. Toops, thank you very much uh, for very inspiring, uh, quick overview of the intricate work that you do. You really are making a difference in the community and we're all very, very grateful for that. We are at the top of the hour. I wanna remember remind everyone to check the chat for the link to get the MOC and CME credits. And if anyone has any questions, please remain on for Dr. Tukes or Dr. Sirota or, any, uh, or, or Dr. Ruiz, uh, if anyone has any questions. Uh, at this point, though, I know some of us have to go to clinic, but uh, wish everyone a, a safe and wonderful day. Thank you to all our speakers.